Well, many thanks to the uh, worship team and the orchestra. Thanks, you guys, for uh, putting that in there. It's great. So I'll come home this afternoon, my wife will say, well, what'd you do today? And I'll say, I got to sing with a bunch of great people and musicians, boy. And I get to preach the word of God. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together please you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we're in a series on the glory and majesty of God, His greatness, His goodness. And we started in a place where it seems least clear, most doubtful, God's glory. Intense, undeserved, human suffering. God has let it happen. And God is silent. And the silence of God is the greatest test of our faith. It does have names. Places like Dachau, Buchenwald, or Pol Pot's Cambodia. It's the terror in the eyes of an abused child or the gaunt stare of an AIDS baby. God's silence can be seen in the rows of amputees in a veteran's hospital or the mentally tortured in the psychiatric ward. God's silence is felt in the weight of crushing grief, as described by C.S. Lewis after his wife died. He wrote, Meanwhile, where is God? When you're happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing Him, so happy that you're tempted to feel His claims on you as an interruption. If you remember yourself and turn to Him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms, but go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seemed so once. And that seeming was as strong as this. What can this mean? Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent in our time of trouble? God can be silent. When people aren't, especially a certain kind of religious person, the chattering kind. Job has to endure these kinds of religious folks for most of the book. Their message is repeated over and over again. God is good and only does good to those who are good too. Think about it. You're suffering. You must not be good. Confess your sins and get right with God. But God will have none of this, or Job will have none of this, And he grows increasingly frustrated, not only with his friends, but with the God he knows he has not offended, but who nevertheless made this happen. I went to visit a friend whose little girl had stage four cancer. Uh, She did survive, but she suffered greatly. So my buddies and I went over to see him and Went down in the basement where he had all the family games and foosball and pool, and we shot some pool. And we all like to laugh, so we're cracking jokes and kind of watching warily uh, our friend, the, the father of this suffering little girl. And he was cracking jokes, very funny guy. But suddenly he stopped just before he made a shot, slammed his pool cue down, and said, When I get to heaven and meet God, I have a lot of questions, and he'll have a lot of explaining to do. Well, Job doesn't say it exactly that way, but almost. Now picture him. He's lost everything, including his health. He's gaunt, 
He's filthy, and he has open and running sores from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And he's defiant. If only someone would listen to me, he says. Look, I will sign my name to my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser write out the charges against me. I would face the accusation proudly. I would wear it like a crown, for I would tell him exactly what I have done. I would come before him, that's God, like a prince. And then another accuser speaks up, Elihu. And he goes on for six more chapters trying to convince Job of his guilt. And finally, in chapter 38, God appears. Job finally gets his day in court. But it's not what he expected. It's not Job asking God his questions. It's God asking Job his. And I can only just touch on a few of them. But you'll get the drift. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. It's funny. When God answers, sometimes it's with a question or questions. Now again, a picture of who God's looking at. This is a suffering man. Uh, take note of God's bedside manner. <laughs> who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Where were you? When I laid the foundations of the earth, tell me. If you know so much, who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundation? And who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? If you've seen the remarkable film by Terrence Malick, A Tree of Life, uh, you'll notice that line's quoted at the very beginning of the film. Really worth watching. Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb and as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness? For I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, this far and no farther will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. And this kind of questioning goes on for two chapters. Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did that? Surely you must know. You know so much. I mean, God is sarcastic. And he asks Job one question after another about what he does in a world that Job simply has no clue as to how to answer. And then God stops in chapter 40. And the Lord said to Job, Do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You're God's critic, but do you have the answers? Then Job replied to the Lord, I'm nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I, I've said too much already. I have nothing more to say. But God is not finished with Job. It's round two and another onslaught for two more chapters of unanswerable questions. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. I want to stop here. I debated whether or not to even tell you about this, but it, it's so strange what happened to me last Saturday. And I know, I know it was not a coincidence. So I'm just going to tell you what happened. Uh, saying ahead of time, I really don't know if I get it yet. Maybe a little bit. But I, I spoke at a men's retreat last uh, Saturday. I was, uh, it was a church in Atascadero, and we went inland to Creston, California, which is a little town. Uh, the, the temperature was three digits. It was so dang hot. It was just miserably hot. And uh, the, most of the men had gone off to the lake, and I, I just needed some time to pray and read scripture. And so I sat out on the front porch of this little house in the shade, and, uh, and I was going to read the book of Job. And I, of course, that's somewhere in the back of my mind. I, I was thinking about this Friday, but I had other things to read. And so I sat down, opened my Bible up, and I looked up on the hill, and there was a whirlwind. And I thought, Immediately, that line, the Lord spoke to Job out of the whirlwind. And so I watched the whirlwind. It went down the hill, and 
into its bottom and made a hard right turn right in my direction. I wasn't scared, but I was like, whoa. I mean, it, it was going that way, and it got down in a straight line with me, and it made a right turn and came right up to me, growing as it got closer, about as far from here to the third row. And it kept growing. And I'm thinking, well, okay. Um, at the very least, I'm going to get really dirty in a minute. So I picked up my Bible and my notes, and I turned to walk inside the house. And the moment I did that, it went this way and dissipated. And I've been thinking about that all week long. I'll come back to what I've been thinking in a few minutes. But that couldn't have been by accident. And so God said to Job, and I'm wondering if he's saying it to me, brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Will you discredit my justice and condemn me just to prove you're right? Are you as strong as God? Can you thunder with a voice like this? All right. Put on your glory and splendor, your honor and majesty. Give vent to your anger. Let it overflow against the proud. Humiliate the proud with a glance. Walk on the wicked where they stand. Bury them in the dust. Imprison them in the world of the dead. Then even I would praise you, for your own strength would save you. Dripping with sarcasm. And this goes on for another two chapters. Are you counting? Four chapters of God asking questions Job can't possibly answer about the world. And often incredibly sarcastic. And Job is reduced to a quivering mass. In chapter 42, Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before. But now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. What are we to make of this? Well, at least two things. God sets Job right on what I like to call the grammar of existence. Now, if you've been around here at all, you've heard me say that from time to time. But you know what grammar is? Grammar is the, uh, the rules by which language makes sense. And if your grammar is messed up, your sentences won't make sense. Uh, there, there, there are proper relationships between nouns and verbs and prepositions and so on. So uh, grammar makes language intelligible. And there's a grammar to existence without which life just doesn't make sense. It's this, God is God, and you're not. And God makes the point in a big way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Think about that. You know, some translations render it reverence, and that's accurate enough. But the word is literally the fear of the Lord, which is the way of saying, I think, your reverence, your humility before God should be like terror in its intensity. You know the way fear just sort of takes you over when you're really afraid? It just rules everything. I think that's why fear is used here. Reverence to God. You're God. I'm not. Have mercy on me. 
if I start acting like I thought I was. That's the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. Well, think about that, the beginning of wisdom. I mean, how could you possibly be right about anything else if you're wrong about such a fundamental thing as God is God and you're not? If you don't get that, you're likely to get really messed up on lesser things. So God sets Job straight. <laughs> I mean, Job's friends were wrong about him. He hadn't done anything, but, but, but Job, as, as, as his, again, it's his suffering. As his suffering continues, he starts thinking, what kind of God is this? And I, I wish I could just sit down and just present my case to him. I wish I could appear in court. I would wear my defense like a prince. God says, oh, no, you wouldn't. God answers none of his questions, not a single question, not one. Now maybe you find yourself not liking this God too much. Well, you have the option. But not liking something that's true and real won't change it. If you hold your breath, the universe won't. God is God. But, but God does something better for Job than simply putting him in his place. He opens Job's eyes to his glory. Job has all these questions. He doesn't get one of them answered. All God does is just sort of just, just bombard him with his finitude, and when it's all over, God's, God's questioning, God's sarcasm, God's reducing of Job, it, it ends up with Job saying, wow, before this, I'd only heard about you, and now I've seen you, and I repent. My friend went with his uh, son and his wife to the uh, Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And uh, his son's a scuba diver, and he just uh, snorkels. So they had a good day at the Barrier Reef. There's a lot to see, I'm, I'm told. And uh, he and his wife snorkeled, got a sunburn on their backs, but saw a lot of wonderful things. The snorkeling. Oh, but his son. His son went down to the depths. And oh, Oh, what he saw. You know, a lot of us are just snorkeling when it comes to God. But to be taken down to the depths, whatever it takes, is to come away saying, oh, I, don't, I don't have to have an answer to all those questions I had because I just saw you, and oh my gosh. The glory of God is man fully alive, said Irenaeus, and the vision of God in the depths is the life of man. The answer to our questions about God is God, period. Let's go to the New Testament. Jesus and his disciples, this is in John chapter 9, they see a man born blind. It's right back with Job again, isn't it? And they're asking Jesus, now who sinned? Did this man in, in utero that he was born blind or his parents that he was born blind? Which is it? And Jesus said, neither. This was to show the work or the glory of God. Now think about that. I mean, he's, he's, full, he's, he's a grown-up. I don't I mean, at the very least, he's 18 or 19, but he has spent his whole life as a beggar. He's blind. He can't see. And everybody's thinking the same thing. They're thinking, now, who, is, it, is this his fault or his parents' fault? What a, what a miserable existence. And it goes on for years. And then Jesus says, God brought this thing because he wants to show the world his glory, his works.
And do you think? Do you think it was worth it to this man? I think it was. I think it was. Everyone who's ever got a glimpse of the greatness of God will say, oh, oh, anything for that. Moses begged God to let him look at him. And God says, you can't stand it. But I will walk by you and let you peek and just see my glory go by. Job is like the resistance fighter in philosopher Basil Mitchell's parable. Uh, his country is captive to an evil army of occupation. One night he meets a stranger who makes a deep impression on him. The stranger tells him that he's leader of the resistance and urges him to trust him no matter what he sees. When the night has passed and they part company, the resistance fighter is completely confident that this stranger is who he said he was. They never meet again in conditions of intimacy, although he does see the stranger often. Sometimes he sees him helping his friends in the resistance, and they will say, look, he's on our side. He's helping us. Other times he sees him dressed in the uniform of an army of occupation, handing over patriots to the firing squad. And then his friends will curse the stranger. The fighter will insist he's still on our side. The stranger knows best. I grew up in a gospel preaching, gospel singing Baptist church in La Puente, California. And we sang a little song. It's kind of a ditty, really, but I had no idea how, how important it was. By and by. When the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story. How we overcome, we will understand it better by and by. Well, what about that whirlwind I saw? I don't know all that it means for me personally, but I do know I walked away thinking, if it takes me to where it took Job, and to say, I th I've only heard about you, but now I see you. then I want to go there. I do. And I know something else. I know something that Job did not know. The Apostle Paul said the gospel is the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Christ, who is the image of God. And when I look at that face, I see tears. I see blood from a crown of thorns. I see hands with nail prints and feet driven through. I see a tortured, racked body raised in glory. And he said to John one Lord's day, I am the first and the last. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys to death in Hades. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You know, if God gave us answers, reasons, well, we just have more questions. But to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus is to see every question put back in its place and say, oh, thank you, Lord that you showed me that. You showed me you. God is the best answer 
to your questions. Father, we love you. We want to trust you better. We believe that you are good and that everything that comes to us passes through your heart of love. And that we have a great high priest in the heavenlies who sprinkled that place with his own blood and who is sympathetic when he hears our prayers and who will be vindicated in the resurrection and us with him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ.